Dr. Paul I. Bennett mm -hmm. for today's life changing word. Hallelujah. <laughs> to God be all the glory. We give him praise. Take your Bible in your right hand and repeat it and raise it before the Lord and repeat after me. This is my Bible. God gave it to me. And it's mine. 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 All mine. I am what the Bible says I am. I have what the Bible says I have. I can do what the Bible says I can do. Today, I will hear God's word by the power of the Holy Spirit. I will receive God's word by faith. I will achieve God's word by obedience. I'm anointed to receive. Pastor Paul is anointed to deliver. Thank you for the word today. To you be all the glory, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Most holy God, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Amen. Please open your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Praise God. 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Corinthians is one of the Pauline epistles to the church. They are instructional manuals on how to conduct the business of the church. With that said, it gives a information that is relevant for any church age. We are in the beginning throngs of a new teaching series entitled 911, The Weapons of Our Warfare. And today is lesson number two, entitled, How Can We Identify Apostates? How Can We Identify Apostates? Could I ask you a question? What is a secret agent? Talk to me, babies. A spy. All right, now watch this, watch. I learned that during World War II, some of our American citizens of brown hue who could not use their talents to make a living here in America but could use their talents to make a living in Europe where they were readily accepted, were secret agents working for the United States government. These individuals, most of whom were very attractive women with beautiful voices, would entertain individuals from the German army and you know, you put enough liquor in them and put enough prettiness in front of them, they'll start talking like, you know, canaries. Amen. And that stuff was being funneled back to the, um, the allied forces. Amen. But do you think if the German army had known that this beautiful, brown-skinned, silver-throated goddess was, in fact, a spy, would they have spilled information to them? Would they have given them their audience? Would they have entertained them? They entertained them because they did not understand that that was a wolf in sheep's clothing. Apostates are wolves in sheep's clothing. They're in the church. They look like the church. They talk like the church, but they are evangelists of Lucifer, sent to undermine the gospel, its propagation, and the people of the kingdom. I didn't mean to unload a bomb at the beginning, but it just seemed appropriate. Amen. How can we identify apostates? 1 Corinthians chapter 9 Let's look at verses 29 through 27. Now, God told me and I promised him I'd be obedient. I am not rushing this thing. There is too much to unpack for me to try to go quickly. 
If you looked at the mountain of scriptures that I sent you guys by way of what's in this lesson, I stopped because I just couldn't type anymore. And then I said, Lord, this is overwhelming. I was at the <coughs> automobile um, dealership yesterday getting my car serviced. And I was going over my notes, and as you know, mechanic places are not quiet. And I was having trouble just, you know, um, concentrating. I literally put my fingers in my ears trying to close everybody out because I'm like, i got to study. And an individual who was next to me, he was obviously doing work as well. He said, well, praise God, my name is so-and-so. Uh, what are you doing? I said, I I'm a pastor. I'm working on my message. He said, oh, that's incredible. And we chit-chatted for about a minute, and I said, as a pastor, we can't get it wrong. People's lives depend on getting it right. And so I'm there struggling, trying to get it. And it seemed like everybody and their grandfather who needed to have a loud, obnoxious conversation came and stood right behind me. <laughs> Hallelujah. Then um, I, I had to uh, minister to my darling wife, and we went um, out to um, one of her, her siblings' homes. And um, even though she is supposed to be home, I've come to learn that every once in a while, even with the doctor putting you on lockdown, you just need to put your mask on and get out the house and just have a little downtime. And that's what she did with her brother and her sister-in-law yesterday. Yes, she kept the mask on. Amen. We're not stupid. Glory to God. And yes, I was there to make sure she was okay. I am a husband. Praise God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. But I couldn't study there either. And so... I said, let me just get up early this morning, and I just prayed, and I said, Father, I've got all these notes, and I don't know how I'm supposed to get all 19 of these things in today, and my father loves me so much, and he's so patient with me. He said, who told you to do all 19 today? He said, just give them this day, the daily bread that I gave you. And all of a sudden, at five-something this morning, the Holy Ghost just started to flow. Because I was trying to lift the weight of this message in my own ability and intellect instead of casting all my cares on the Lord because he cares for me. And so, in obedience to God, I'm letting you know that even the servant of God has the same challenges you have when we try to do things in our own strength and ability. Amen? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy path. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, find verse 24. We're going to read uh, down to verse 27. It says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So run that ye may, be, may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now, they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep my body, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. May the Lord add a blessing to the teaching of his word. As we go back, it starts off with a question. Know ye not, don't you know, that they which run in a race run all? Have you ever seen a race? Years ago, some church members, we went to Penn Relays. And in Penn Relays, what you have is you have all of the best collegiate athletes and athletes of different ages, but let's just be honest, the group of us who went, went to see the kids from Jamaica. We did. Our high school and grammar school track um, um, kids are so good that they compete with college athletes over here and win. And win. That's because they're Silicon and Margaret. Never mind. No, no, let me go on. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. But uh, Jamaica has a storied history in track and field. It says, know ye not that they which run in a race run all. Everyone say, everyone runs. Everyone runs. I never saw a race where Usain Bolt lined up and the gun went off and everybody else just said, I quit. Everyone ran. 
And if they had any common sense, they ran trying to win. Are you with me? Even though they were in the race with maybe the best sprinter right now in the history of sprinting. Now, I don't big that up more than I should because give it another five years and somebody will come along and start eclipsing his records. Amen? But the scriptures start off with this. Don't you know that they which run in a race run all? All of them run? But hold it. But one receiveth the prize. Hold up, hold up, Paul. That, that, that's confusing. Because when I was looking in the Olympics, three people got prizes. They gave a prize to the, the gold medal winner, O'Shea. That's whoever, whoever came in first. He got gold. And, and Christian, whoever came in second, they got silver. And then whoever came in third, what did they get? Sounds like three prizes, right? All righty. Uh, uh, let me get in your head. How many of you have ever seen, after the Olympic Games are over, anyone running around parading their bronze and silver medals? The only people who still really parade them are those who got the gold. Somebody say first place. It says here, don't you know that they which run in the race run all, but one rece receiveth the prize for first place. So run that ye may obtain. Somebody say run to win. Run to win. If you're not going to run to win, why even show up? Amen? If you're not going to play to win, why even play? If you're not going to compete in order to win, why even compete? The whole concept of competition is to win. If it's not to win, then it's not a competition. Amen, somebody? It says, run that ye may obtain. In other words, run the race in a way that you can win. Amen. Run that ye may obtain. Now, and every man that striveth, every man that striveth, this is a crazy Greek word, it's agonizomai. Do you hear the word agonizing in there? It means to strenuously exert yourself in order to win. When I played football, one of the things that's necessary for that is weight training. If you've ever been in the gym, there are two kinds of people in the gym. There are normal people, and then there are weightlifters. What's the difference, Paul? Well, normal people do this. <sighs> weightlifters. Bam! Like they're demon possessed. Am I talking right? That's why some of you are afraid to go to the gym now. You over in the, in, 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 in the corner and you hear somebody, ah! somebody's having a child. No, no, they're just lifting weights. Amen. But I've come to understand that. Those individuals who get to that hollering and screaming place, they've been lifting and lifting and lifting and lifting so that the uh, magnitude of weight that they're lifting is usually well above what normal people go to the gym to lift. When I was in high school, I used to um, um, squat 665 pounds. If I try to do that now, remember the first part of the message, 911? Every last one of you are free to call that right away. Amen. The things that you can do when you're young and strong are not the same things as you age gracefully. Amen. But, but I didn't start out at 600 pounds. I started out at 300 pounds. And then you get a little bit stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger. I'm going somewhere with this. Amen. It says here, Know you not that they which run in the race run all, but one receiveth the prize? So, Run ye, you run so that you can obtain, that you can obtain the prize, that you can be a winner. Now watch this, watch this. Your running to win in a race excludes everyone else from winning if you win. When Usain Bolt got the gold, 
Nobody else did. When, uh, what's his name, Gant from the USA, when he got the gold, nobody else did. When that guy from Britain who was doing the steroids, when he got the gold, <laughs> no one else did until he got busted for steroids, then he didn't get it either. Amen. What, what I'm saying is, in the world, somebody say the world, the world system is set up that you try to put down, hinder, injure other people so that you can win at their expense. That's the sin system. That's the crabs in a barrel. You know, you take out one crab and all the other crabs are holding on to it, trying to pull it back into the barrel. Amen. But the, the, the system of our kingdom is different. Run so that you might obtain. Watch this. You ready for this? Sister Kelman, when you run and win, you are better equipped to help somebody else run and win. So the difference is in Christ's kingdom, we run to win so that others can run to win. In the world's kingdom, you run to win so it's me, myself, and mine. Our kingdom, our winning is selfless. The world's winning is selfish. We want to be better so that we can help others be better. Can I get an amen? amen. To God be all the glory. Hallelujah. So, Run that ye may obtain. Now, now, every man that striveth, strains, agonizes, pushes himself for the mastery is temperate. That word temperate means self-controlled. Everyone who's training, be it for athletic games or to do warfare in the spirit, must be self-controlled. Controlled. Why? You have to be able to get into a regime or a regimen that helps you day after day after day to get better. Um, when I played football, we had this disgusting habit. Don't know who came up with this, this satanic madness. It was called practice. Didn't matter if it was 30 degrees or 20 below. We were outside. Practice. Didn't matter if outside the ground was hard or if it was sopping wet. Practice. And the practice was always grueling and hard. And I used to wonder, coaches, man, why do y'all make this practice so hard? So that when you're in the game, you are so well prepared the game is easier than the practice. Anybody here ever serve in the military? Outside of the people actually dying, you know boot camp is designed to be as hard as it can be so that you are prepared for actual warfare. Amen? We're talking about how to identify apostates in this spiritual warfare. Stay with me now. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate, self-controlled, in all things. Somebody say in all things. Now, as I was meditating on this this morning, I mean, the Holy Ghost was just downloading stuff. What does a, an athlete have to be self-controlled in? Their diet. I mean, top-of-the-line athletes don't eat pizza and soda five days a week. They don't. They watch their diet. So they watch what they put into their mouth. Watch what you put in your mouth, Christians. Watch the words coming out of your mouth and also watch the spiritual food you're consuming. Amen? One of the things I've also found out about top athletes is they have to watch and make sure they get enough rest. I know, I'm going to sound hypocritical. Christian, get your rest. Get enough rest. The Lord commanded me to get more rest, and all of the ministerial staff know what I'm talking about. Amen. And I'm not trying not to rest. I just have to be disciplined and obedient. And I thank God for certain individuals in this church who, if I'm not, they'll come to me privately and say, Pastor, do you remember what God told you? You've not been obedient. You need to get your rest. Thank God for him. Amen. Because you can't function well when you're not rested. Have you ever seen when Skippy tries to get up in this pulpit and preach? He's a fool and he talks mess. 
But that only happens when I don't get my... See, I'm rhyming. Perfect timing. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. In all things, you got to watch your diet, your exercise. You got to have a, a, a schedule, a regime, prayer and the word. Amen. And then you've got to practice, practice, practice. You have to practice your Christian faith. I said you have to practice your Christian faith. Christianity is easy to fake on Sundays in church. It is. But the rubber meets the road on Monday morning and leaves the road on Saturday night. You have to practice being a believer. You have to practice being a person of faith. You have to practice walking in love. You have to practice patience. Amen, somebody? My daughter, Ashley Victoria, has developed into a truly beautiful, wonderful, wise young lady. And I think it was either yesterday or the day before, she had to take me aside and correct me. Yes. Um, I'm just like you. I get frustrated. And this journey with my wife and health has been a difficult one. Amen? But God is faithful, and we are seeing improvements, and for that we give God all the glory. But, uh, yeah, amen. Yeah, that, that, that one, you can clap that one up. Amen. Yeah. We've been fighting this for a long time, and to start seeing some improvement now, we give God praise. But um, if my wife is watching, I, I hope I remember to apologize to her. I was short with her. And it's not that she did anything wrong. She did nothing wrong. All she did was be the one in, her, in pain and hurting and in need of assistance. I was the one who was wrong. I got short with her because I let myself get overly tired. And my daughter came aside and said, um, Daddy, if you want her to listen to you, you've got to stay patient. And she literally modeled how to talk. She said, when, when you're at work, if I try to get her to do something, I'll say this. And then, you know, I give her a reason. And then we talk about the reason. But you stay patient. And so, Ashley, Daddy wants to thank you for being the voice of God in my ears to remind me how much I love my wife. And because I do, I have to remain patient. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 You can learn from children if you shut up and listen. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And I thank God for my kids. Now, every man that striveth for mastery is temperate in all things. Now, they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. Can we go a little deeper? They do it to obtain a corruptible crown. Somebody say crown. The monarchy has transitioned in Great Britain, and we now have a new sovereign, a new king. And during the coronation, which many of you watched, they probably put a crown on his head, right? Gold crown, encrusted with jewels. That's not what's being spoken of here. Stay with me. It says here, now they do it in the world, the athletes, to obtain a corruptible crown. Now the actual word crown there, the Greek is Stephanos. It's a mark of royal or exalted rank. So when you get a crown, you're either exalted as a monarch or you're exalted among your peers. Amen. So to get this crown, which was really a wreath or garland, it was given as a prize to the winner in public games. Everyone say public. So everyone saw you get your crown. Stay with me. You won. Everyone saw that you won. And to show everyone that you won, you got a garland or wreath to put on your head so everyone could see your 
crown. Now, what did that crown mean? I'm number one. You're number two. I'm number one. You're number three. I'm number one and you are not. That's exactly what it means. I'm the best. Amen. I'm the best. Amen. If you ask people, okay, who's the best home run hitter? Well, <laughs> the Yankee fans are going to say judge. The Mets fans are going to say Alonzo. I'm going to say Hank Aaron, even though Bobby Bonds has more home runs. Because Hank Aaron didn't do drugs. He didn't do steroids. It's a matter of perspective, amen? So when people look at a victor, what do people do when they see champions? First, they identify with them. Next, they want to emulate and imitate them. So when I was a boy, I was, well, it was first Cassius Clay, then it became Muhammad Ali. Float like a butterfly, sting like a bee. And I wanted to be like Ali, not because I knew what, anything about boxing. First time I put on gloves and actually boxed another kid, he knocked me loopy. That was the end of me wanting to be a boxer, amen. But before that happened, I just emulated him because I saw him. I saw his excellence. I saw him winning. I saw him doing this stuff with his feet, going like this, and then punching the person with the other hand. It was just cool. Winning is cool. And people look at winners, and they want to be just like Mike. They want to be like a winner. Amen. It says here, Every man that striveth for mastery is tempered in all things, but they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. Anybody here ever get flowers from somebody, picked flowers? Those picked flowers look beautiful for about one day. And if you do not put them in water, by the next day they start to do what? They are becoming corrupt. Stay with me. I'm number one. I'm number one. I've got a crown. And by the next day, it's starting to wilt. And people see that. They will see in the world that the crowns might exalt you for a moment, but give it a little while and they'll forget your name. The crowns may put you in the limelight for a moment, but, but, but give it a little while and they forget your name. I'll prove it. The best running back in the history of the NFL is not called the best running back. He didn't play long enough or get the accolades that he should have. His name is Jim Brown, and he played for Syracuse University. If Jim Brown played football today, he'd have about 3,000 yards every year. He was a beast. But he played during a time when all running backs had was enough face masks to cover their, their lips. And people, this is true history, used to, because he was black, reach into his mask and try to gouge out his eyes. And so one day, Mr. Brown bit somebody. And when he was asked, why did you bite the man? He said, everything on the outside of the mask belongs to him. Everything on the inside of this mask belongs to me. So those fingers were mine. Why do I bring this up? How many times have you heard in the last 10 years people talking about Jim Brown as a football player? As great as he was. And he's not dead. Because that's the way the world is. They will exalt you, but it will not last. And it only benefits the individual. But that's not our kingdom. It says, now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. Watch this now. But we, an incorruptible, when we put on the crown of salvation, when we put on the Lord Jesus Christ, it does not corrupt after a few days but it's just as public I said it's just as public 
you guys got a wonderful testimony today. Praise God. Minister Paul Wade was here minding his business, working on the sound system, singing unto the Lord. And his God, 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 his incorruptible crown was heard by somebody outside walking outside the church. Rhema word. Christian, you will, you will reach and affect more people outside the church with your incorruptible crown than you ever will inside the church. You see, you've got to take your incorruptible crown with you every day to work. You've got to take your incorruptible crown with you every day to shop right. You've got to take your incorruptible crown with you to Costco. You've got to take your incorruptible crown with you to, to your boss's office when you work for a cantankerous, evil, snaggletooth dragon. You must represent Christ. And then even without you knowing, you are positively affecting others who look at you walking around like I'm number one. And first they appreciate it. What does she have that I don't have? What makes her so gracious, so, so graceful, so, so peaceful in the midst of this madness? I want that. And then they want to emulate you. So they'll try to imitate it in the natural. They will. And they will fall flat on their face, which moves them to come to you and say, how do you do this? H how? How? And that's when you get an opportunity to share your incorruptible crown and tell them about Jesus Christ. Can I get an amen? amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Told you I wasn't going to rush. Too important. Thank you so much. I think I'll listen. Glory to God. Verse 26, I, the Apostle Paul, therefore so run, not as uncertainly. I don't run like I don't know what direction I'm supposed to race in. Marlon, I know, Marlon Ben, I know you know this. There was a time when this individual, it was a college game, I don't remember the teams, and this guy intercepted the ball and got spun around and started running in the wrong direction back towards their own end zone, and one of their own players had to chase him down and tackle him. When we get, on your mark, get set, go. We don't do that. <laughs> We're running with a goal in mind. Amen, somebody. In other words, as we walk this Christian journey, as we run this Christian race, as we fight this Christian fight, we have to do so, Didi, with a goal in mind. And that goal is to God be all the glory. Hallelujah. To glorify God. To bless the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. So we don't run, watch this, we don't run as uncertainly, without direction. And it says, so fight I, this is the Apostle Paul, not as one that beateth the air. I've been an educator for more than 30 years, and I've seen my share of children engaged in pugilistic activities. Oh, y'all know me in words. Fights. Sometimes it's the funniest thing to see two children, forgive me, who have lost their temper with each other, and neither of them know how to fight. They are both stand there with their eyes closed going like this. It's the funniest thing. The only thing that's hitting are the hands against each other, which is a good fight. Amen. Nobody's getting hurt. Paul is saying, I don't fight like somebody's just swinging. When I fight, I understand who my enemy is. We don't wrestle hey, against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. But with that said, we know Lucifer is our enemy, but he uses his agents as his gloves. So while the gloves are not my enemy, it's okay to duck the gloves. Duck the gloves. I was watching Muhammad Ali when he was really, really young, and he would have his hands by his side, and you couldn't hit him. 
He would duck. He would move. Joe Frazier had him up in the corner through about 15 punches. Not one landed. Not one. And Joe finally got smart and said, okay, the head is moving too fast. Let me go to the body. You have to be able to, as believers, understand that, okay, the glove is not my enemy, but it is the thing that's coming from my head. It's okay to block the glove. There's some individuals that you have to learn, Christians, to block out of your life. They're not helping you. They're hurting you. They're not lifting you. They're lowering you. They're not blessing you. They're cursing you. They're not good for you. I don't care how good he looks or how shapely she is. I don't care how wealthy they are or how talented they are. If it's not God's best for you, it's not God's best for you. Amen. Amen. Man, I must have thought there were about four or five girls I was going to marry before I met my wife. And I'm grateful to the Holy Ghost for one word. No! Dr. Edwin Lewis Cole taught me in the Circle Sanctuary of Redeeming Love Christian Center, marriage is the closest thing on earth to either heaven or hell. And it depends on who you choose to marry. If you choose God's best for you, it'll be heaven. If you, if you don't choose his best, well. And that's why we must always seek God's direction. There's a perfect person out there for everyone if you're willing to wait. I have a friend named Sandy and her husband, Tony, and she got married when she was over 50. And they are the happiest couple today. But if I don't get married, man, I, I, I get into all. Newsflash, if you don't die, you're going to get old anyway. Hallelujah. You're not in a rush to get married. You're not in a rush to get anything. Listen to God. So you don't end up regretting decisions because you jumped stupidly out ahead of his direction. Can I get an amen? Man, this is good teaching. I wish somebody would preach me to do it. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I mean, this is, I mean, I don't have this in my notes. And so we give God all the, all the glory. Amen? Hallelujah. Praise God. Now it says right here, it says right here. You ready for this? but I keep under my body. The Greek there literally says, because now, now look at what we just finished talking. We finished talking about racing and fighting. And he takes the same imagery and takes it to the next verse. I keep under my body literally means I hit myself in the face over and over and over and over. In other words, look, look, look. When you're fighting a fight, you have to identify the enemy. Paul identifies his enemy, the glove, as him. So now he is beating himself because he knows his own physical flesh could be his worst enemy if he lets it. Jesuit preached year, years ago. I don't know if they still do it. They used to have things that were like cat and nine tails, and in their prayer time, they used to whip themselves, flagellate themselves. I am not saying to do that, but I want you to understand the concept. They were so intent on not letting these bodies lead them into sin and away from God that they were willing to do that the apostle Paul is saying that's what I do not that I flagellate myself but I keep my body under it I beat it up I beat it down why and this is the point that we're going to end off on today I keep my body under I literally knock myself out and bring it into subjection make it my slave lest that by any means when I have preached, somebody say preached, when I have preached to others, I, the great apostle Paul, myself, should be a castaway. What? A castaway is the Greek word adokimos. It means reprobate, disqualified, rejected, Christless. The apostle Paul says, I keep my body in check. Lest after I have preached to others, let me just put in my own stuff. I have preached to the multitudes, folk have been saved. I have preached to the multitudes, folk have been healed. I have preached to the multitude, people have been delivered from devils. I have preached, I have taught, I have ministered, I have blessed. People know my name, yet at the end, because I didn't keep my own body in check, I am Christless. Bible! 
Bible. Bible. And yet there are people who will tell you, oh, once you're saved, don't worry about it. You can do anything you want to do, live any way you want to live, and you, you, you're good. You're gravy. <laughs> Hallelujah. I want to go in directions, but I'm going to listen to God. I'm going to end off with this question. Well, I, 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 let, let me build it up. What is an apostate? One who has fallen away, defected. He's left and forsaken the faith. It is a willful choice of desertion from the allegiance, loyalty, and duty to the Christian faith which they once legitimately embraced. Now the lie that will be told, unfortunately, in Christian circles is when you come across individuals acting like this, Deacon Ken, they will say, oh no, they were never legitimately saved. They just had a religious experience. Somebody say poppycock. Beldedash. I'm sorry, that, that was my homage to the queen right there. Amen, I'm done. That's foolishness, no. Who can be Christless? The Apostle Paul said he can be. If he won't keep his body under subjection. The Apostle Paul said that. The Apostle Paul. The greatest of all the apostles. Amen. It said, I could end up a castaway after preaching to everybody else. Stay with me now. They will say, oh, that individual was never saved. No, 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 no. If you were never saved, you are lost. Not an apostate. In order to be an apostate, first you would have had to have been saved, which is born again. If you're lost, you've never been born again. So you act like that because you are lost. You act like that because you are lost. But when someone is born again, but then they go back to acting and living like they were lost, guess what? If you're an apostate, you're going to hear the first time you've ever heard this, this expression. You ready? You have now become lost again. Did the Holy Ghost make it plain? I didn't hear that word until yesterday. Trying to, actually, it was in the dealership, trying to hear God. Yes, you can be born again. And an apostate is somebody who is now lost again. Do you have scripture for that? Oh, yes, I do. I'll be taking you to Hebrews next time. Because you have put Christ right back up on the cross and you've personalized, personally crucified him one more time. You are apostate, lost again. So in closing, who can be lost again? Given the right set of choices and circumstances, any believer can be lost again, even the great Apostle Paul. Sobering word. I used to like watching certain preachers on TV, Reverend Elijah, because they always preach happy messages. And it made me feel so happy. Come along if you feel like a room without a roof. So happy. But I came to find out that kind of preaching is kind of like having ice cream every day. It tastes good. But it starts to do something to your waistline, your glycemic index, your cholesterol. A little treat every once in a while is, is not bad, but when your treat becomes your meal, there's going to be a challenge. And I like to, when I can, leave you with a cliffhanger. This is an homage to my favorite show as a child, the original black and white Batman. Before we get into it, what are the observable characteristics of apostates? We will touch on 19 of them, but I'm going to encapsulate them with one statement. Defection in doctrine always brings a decline in morality. 
the more you get away from Christian doctrine, teaching, and practice, the more you will act like the world, like a sinner, like you're lost. And that is why this COVID pandemic is nothing but a Luciferian plot to pluck the weak out of church and keep them out because the weak are easiest to pick off. So as we get ready to close, church, y'all got some work to do. If you think this is pastor work, no, 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 I'm doing pastor work right now. Church, we've got some work to do. There are some individuals you know who have not seen the inside of a church since when donkey gone dentist. And you call them your friends. Act like they're friends. What do you do when you invite a friend over to dinner and they keep hooing and hawing about why they can't come? You say, look here, stop the foolishness. I'll come pick you up. All the problems you have, we'll, we'll work on it. I have some goat head soup here and you're going come fit now. You don't take no for an answer, do you? Why? They're your friend. You'll do whatever is necessary because they are your friend friend. How much more spiritual things? But pastor, if I keep telling Bobby about church, he's not going to want to date me anymore. I'm sorry. I, I don't know whose toes I just stepped on. But if Bobby doesn't want to go to church, <clears throat> it is written, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Christians should not marry unbelievers. And if you shouldn't, then why are you dating them? Dating is a prelude to marriage. That's all dating is. You're trying to figure out whether or not you guys are compatible. And no, you don't give away the milk. They have to earn it. You've got to put a ring on it. This is the kind of stuff that churches need we need a word that goes right where we're living. We have a congregation full of young people, attractive young people, some almost as good looking as me. I don't know why they always laugh when I say that. Amen. You better have somebody encouraging you to walk holy because it's too easy to start stepping out into the flesh and doing this. And thinking that you're fighting the devil, thinking you're fighting the spiritual warfare, but really all you're doing is fighting what your pastor said, I don't want to hear it. Ooh, that was a good word right there, Lord. Because that will not allow me to do what I want to do. Well, that kind of a crown is corruptible. It doesn't last. doesn't give you lasting joy. But people are still watching it, and you're still going to be an example. If you're going to be an example... Be a good one. May the Lord add a blessing to the teaching of his word. For those of you who are in the sanctuary and those who are, are listening um, via media, you may not have received Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord yet. To which I always ask the, the, the same question, what are you waiting for? Really, what are you waiting for? My lie when I was growing up is, um, I'm going to do it tomorrow. And then I heard a song called Tomorrow that kind of shook me up. You see, the truth is, we don't really know what tomorrow holds for us. None of us knew two weeks ago that the queen was going to die. We knew she was old, but we didn't know. There's a song that my auntie and my mom used to sing, and I think some of you might know it. It says, I know who holds tomorrow, and I know he holds my hand. Only God knows tomorrow, beloved. You don't. All you have is right here and right now. The Word of God says, if we will confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, we'll be saved. For with the heart, heart, man believes on the righteousness, right with God. 
and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation, and you become born again. Why do we give an altar call? I'm going to show you step by step how to receive Jesus Christ as Lord, so you don't have to wonder if you did it right. Amen. Devil gets no place. I'm going to say a prayer right now, and I'm going to ask everyone in the sanctuary to join me. I'm going to ask everyone on the internet to join me. Repeat after me. Dear God in heaven, thank you that Jesus died for my sins. I believe that. Thank you that Jesus is risen from the dead. I believe that. I confess with my mouth right now I take Jesus Christ as an act of my personal will. This is my decision. It's my choice. I want it right now. I take Jesus Christ as the Lord of my life. Everything I am, I give to Jesus. All that Jesus is, he now gives to me. Thank you, Lord, that today I'm born again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you just said that prayer for the first time and meant it, I didn't say if you just said that prayer. You could have said it 20 times before. But if you meant it, if something was pricking you on the inside, that's the Holy Ghost. I want to be the first one to welcome you to the, the family of God, the church, the body of Christ. If you receive Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord today, and you're in the sanctuary, honor the Lord and honor your pastor by just raising your hands right where you are so that we can give God glory and honor and praise for you. Amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. As I look around, I don't see any hands raised, so I have to believe that in the sanctuary, we're wall-to-wall -wall believers, and if not, there are people who are still thinking. Now, if you're on the internet and you pray that prayer with us for the first time, praise God. Let us know in the chat. We'd love an opportunity to thank God for you. Now, what's the first thing you need to do? If you just got born again, find a church. Find a church. The most dangerous place for soldiers is off by themselves away from the rest of their troop. They're easier to pick off, but there's safety in numbers. So when you come to the church, you're coming to a garrison of well-armed believers. Hallelujah. But additionally, you're also coming to family. People who will love you and nurture you. Your, your drill sergeant's not going to do that. But the church will. Because we want to help you to grow and be big and be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Amen. You got to come to church. But I watch you on the internet. Yeah, I used to watch Flip Wilson on TV too. Didn't make me Geraldine. Church is not something that you watch. Church is something that you participate in. That's like zoom in your husband and your wife and say oh baby I love you I love you. we have such a wonderful relationship we zoom each other every day somebody say that doesn't make sense for me being away from my wife during the day is hard I can't see not you know interacting with her that that's that's what a marriage is that's what family is I get to get to see my daughter get to see my son hear their voice hear their stupidity and then hear mine well, church is all about that, good, bad, and ugly. We're not perfect, but we're family. And you get to come here and grow so that you can turn around and help somebody else grow. Amen? So if you receive Jesus Christ today, to God be all the glory. We're happy for you and happy with you.